Today's big story, Parliament kicks off the debate on a proposed law against foreign interference. Will home-based learning be extended for primary schools? We'll find out later this week. And for those fully vaccinated who get COVID-19, we've got some tips for you on home recovery. You're watching The Big Story. I'm Harianto Diman. Subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. The proposed law to tackle foreign interference taking up the majority of today's parliament sitting, with the debate lasting nearly five hours now. At the start of the sitting, a petition submitted to Parliament to delay the passage of the proposed law and seek further consultation was rejected. And so, with the debate going ahead in a two-hour-long speech, one of the points Home Affairs and Law Minister K. Shanmugam addressed were the bill's misconceptions. Some of these doomsday scenarios that FICA is going to close off foreign, foreign collaborations, if that is correct, uh, we as a government because must have suddenly gone mad because in a country like Singapore, which depends so much on the flow of ideas and international collaboration, is that even thinkable? But the difficulty we face at MHA and which many other countries face in, in dealing with this foreign interference issue is that out of 10,000 interactions, one might be the sort that we are interested in, where there is an attempt to interfere. And foreign agencies, and even non-agencies, NGOs, others, will try and present a legitimate front. So the language has got to be broad enough to cover that, that what is apparently normal, but is actually not normal. Introduced about three weeks ago, on September 13th, the proposed Foreign Interference Countermeasures Act or FICA targets foreign interference in domestic politics conducted through hostile information campaigns as well as the use of local proxies. In response to the Workers' Party's proposed amendments, Mr Shanmugam clarified the conditions for a hostile information campaign or HIC direction and the designation of a politically significant person or PSP. So for HIC directions, to refresh members' memory, there has to be online activity where material is published in Singapore. It has to be done on behalf of a foreign principal, and public interest in Singapore is likely to be affected. For PSP designation, the person's or entity's activities must be directed wholly or in part towards a political end, and the competent authority must additionally assess that it is in the public interest for countermeasures to be applied. Leader of the opposition, Pritam Singh, questioned why the government didn't seek public feedback before FICA was first tabled on September 13th. Uh, Mr Speaker, there has been considerable disquiet in some quarters at the speed at which this bill has been presented to Parliament. In March this year at the Committee of Supply Debates, uh, Deputy Speaker Christopher D'Souza inquired why, what MHA would do to deter foreign influence in Singapore's domestic affairs. The Second Minister for Home Affairs, the Honourable Mrs jo Josephine Teo, addressed the query and announced that legislative levers may be needed. I quote, Given the recent experience of other countries, we need to consider further measures to guard against foreign subversion of politically significant individuals and entities. For example, what levels of transparency in funding, support and leadership are appropriate and for whom? More significantly, Minister then went on to say, and I quote, the public has a big part in this to shape proposals and to give the eventual safeguards their strongest support. It is the only way we can effectively deter bad foreign actors from exploiting our vulnerabilities, unquote. The bill is still being debated in Parliament. You can visit straightstimes.com to read more. With Primary 1 to Primary 5 pupils scheduled to be back in school next Monday, Education Minister Chan Chun Seng said the Ministry will soon be announcing if the current home-based learning period will be extended beyond this week. Uh, MOE will be making an announcement later this week. The reason why I'm not making an announcement today are as follows. One, because we are in the middle of PSLE, I would like to have all the 
school leaders and the teachers to focus on the task at hand first. Second, we are also proceeding with our internal preparations and communications with our educators and I'd like them to know our decision collectively first before we make the announcement later part of this week in tandem with the national posture. Mr Chan also said MOE will do what's necessary to ensure that the O and N A levels can be conducted safely. Pointing to the high vaccination rate among pupils in the secondary school level and above, he said, quote, the kind of anxiety the students or their families may face is quite different. Ministers also responding to questions on the government's handling of the COVID-19 situation. Our transition journey to living with COVID-19 is unique in this world, in the sense that we did not allow ourselves to go through big waves of transmission last year, which many countries did and suffered tremendous loss of lives. Today, when we see other countries opening up and living lives almost normally, let's not forget the heavy price that they have paid last year. We commence our transition journey only after we have vaccinated the large majority of our population, so that for the vast majority of infected persons, they now have no or mild symptoms. I believe our plan is as comprehensive and as effective it can be. Questions were also raised over the frustration and confusion over the many COVID-19 procedures currently in use. Senior Minister of State for Health, Janil Putucheri, stressed that it's important to detect possible infections early to minimise the impact of transmission to household members, friends or colleagues. There are some who have a misconception that we are testing widely to attempt to eliminate the virus. This is not so. We have many community cases around us. Our widespread testing aims to reduce the overall rate of transmission from each COVID-19 infection slowing the spread in the community. ART testing also, individuals also, ART testing also enables individuals to perform self-testing and do our own part to slow down this transmission of the virus. These strategies will allow us to ride the wave of infections without overwhelming our healthcare and public health response resources. Dr. Janil added that the government will also evaluate whether there is a need to conduct another nationwide distribution of ART kits to support regular self-testing. The Health Ministry telling The Straits Times that more than 11,000 companies have applied to receive antigen rapid test kits from the government. Among them, 4,200 have received the kits and the rest will get theirs later this week. These free kits will help employees who work on site self-test weekly over a two-month period, which must be done regardless of vaccination status. It can either be administered at home or at the work premises, up to a company's discretion depending on existing work arrangements. With yesterday's COVID-19 numbers, it's been six straight days of Singapore's daily cases exceeding 2,000. 2,057 new infections were reported last night. They comprise 1,676 in the community, 373 dorm residents and 8 imported. Six more fatalities between 68 and 91 years old were also announced yesterday, bringing the, total, bringing the death toll to 113. As at yesterday, 1,337 cases were warded in hospital. Among them, 250 patients needed oxygen support and another 35 were in critical condition in ICU. Of those who have fallen very ill, 242 are seniors above 60. With COVID-19 cases rising sharply and straining our hospitals, we know that home recovery is the default for healthy vaccinated individuals who aren't living with other vulnerable people. The Straits Times answers some questions you may still have about this programme. If you qualify for home recovery, you should receive an SMS with the official isolation order within a few days after testing positive. 
your household contacts will also need to register for an electronic quarantine order. But what if you haven't received the isolation order? If you are PCR positive, you can contact your home recovery buddy on 6874-4939 or your assigned telemedicine provider for help. You can also call the home recovery buddy if you haven't received your home care pack, which is only issued to those who don't have an oximeter at home. And at the end of it all, will there be a discharge memo? Nope, a memo will not be issued for patients who are well on day 10 of home recovery. They will be automatically discharged. After speaking to some home recovery patients, The Straits Times has some tips on how to get through this 10-day period. Around 4 in 10 COVID-19 patients in Singapore are now undergoing home recovery. And that number is set to increase as Singapore moves into the endemic stage of battling the virus. With that, here is a quick guide to home recovery from people who've already undergone the process. If you are living alone, if you have limited antigen rapid test kits or ART tests at home, save them for the later part of your home recovery. After all, there's little point in taking an ART test in the first few days because there's a high likelihood you will still be positive. Don't be shy about asking friends for help. You're going to be confined to your home, so inform your friends to be on standby to get you anything you might need. If you're living with healthy people, communicate virtually to reduce the risk of infection. That means texting and Zoom calls rather than face-to-face -face interaction. You should also wear masks at home and clean surfaces frequently, especially if infected family members do not self-isolate. You may even want to double back your rubbish to give your family better protection from any infection. And if your whole family is COVID positive, keep track of your health with daily temperature and oxygen measurements. Looking overseas, Fumio Kishida has been sworn in as Japan's 100th Prime Minister and is expected to call a general election on October 31st. According to local media reports, the timing is somewhat of a surprise as it was widely predicted that an election would be held either on November 7th or the 14th. It means that Mr Kishida will likely skip his first international outing, the G20 Leaders Summit in Rome at the end of October. Jordan King, Kenya's president and ex-British Prime Minister and Colombian singer Shakira, among the names leaked in a massive trove of financial records known as the Pandora Papers. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists said it found alleged links between high-profile individuals and companies in offshore havens used to hide their wealth. It's not known how the documents were obtained. According to Taiwan's Ministry of Defence, more than 90 Chinese military planes entered the island's air defence zone over the weekend. This comes as China marked its National Day on October 1st. Tweeting about the incursions, Taiwan's Defence Ministry said the Chinese Air Force aircraft flew near the southwestern part of its air defence zone, close to the Pratas Islands. 38 Chinese military planes entered in two waves on Friday, October 1st, followed by another two more waves on October 2nd, with 39 planes in total, the largest incursion in a day to date, and 16 jets yesterday. China has so far made no public comments on the incursions. With more is The Straits Times' China correspondent, Denson Chong. Welcome to the show, Denson. A record number of incursions by Chinese warplanes into Taiwan's air identification zone. Denson, what is the message China is trying to convey? Thanks, Arun. I think, you know, three uh, quite large, fairly large-scale uh, waves of planes, uh, you know, moving towards the the Taiwan's uh, advanced identification zone uh, in three days. I think, you know, coming on China's uh, national day, that's quite significant. Um, you know, some figures show that uh, China has, has conducted almost 200, uh, has, has entered Taiwan's uh, air defense uh, zone almost 200 times uh, this year. So it's becoming a very, very uh, common occurrence. Um, as for the message, you know, that China wants to send, I think there are a few. The first, uh, if you look at 
the, the, the kinds of the makeup of the jets uh, that China has sent, you know, they involved uh, besides fighter jets, uh, also uh, bombers, uh, anti-submarine aircraft, uh, reconnaissance planes. So I think it's trying to signify or, or, or signal that the uh, the China, the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army Air Force uh, combat capability, you know, is is increasing. That they, they can, um, they they can, they have real attack capabilities, and they can operate in a variety of environments and conditions. Second, I think, you know, China wants to send a political message to Taiwan, uh, in that you know it doesn't accept that Taiwan has its own air defense zone. You know, if both sides are one country, then. Uh, you know, Taiwan's air defense zone is China's air defense zone, and the Chinese air force should be able to enter and leave as it pleases. Um, you know, some some Western media, I think, have have sort of said that this uh, could indicate that the threat of war is imminent, but I I don't quite agree because I I feel like you know we've not seen uh, um, Taiwan uh, move towards uh, any of Beijing's red lines, uh, which is you know to to uh, declare formal independence. So I think short of that. Um, I don't think we'll see uh, or the likelihood of war uh, increasing anytime soon. The US State Department has spoken out condemning the Chinese provocation. Denson, how else can the US or Taiwan or any other country for that matter respond? You know, Jan, I think we have to sort of look at this from the mainland's point of view. You know, it looks at Taiwan and it sees the, the Taiwan government and how it's inching towards uh, independence. Uh, you know, and trying to increase its international space. Uh, I think last week or, or in the last few days, uh, we've had uh, Taiwan uh, applying to join the CPTPP. Um, and also, you, you know, we, we've seen the US and the UK uh, increasing their presence in the region, uh, you know, with freedom of navigation operations. And I think I mean, last week, uh, the UK frigate uh, HMS uh, Richmond, you know, did a, a pass through the Taiwan Strait uh, in, in one of those um, FNOPs. So I think from, from Beijing's point of view, uh, it has to sort of turn up the pressure and show that, you know, it's serious uh, about its claims uh, and that, you know, that it's determined to, to uh, unify with, 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 with Taiwan. Uh, so that's why I think you see the, the, the kinds of, uh, the, you know, uh, PLA uh, sorties and, and drills increasing uh, around Taiwan. I think the one thing that, that will... will that I'm quite certain will happen is that you know with with more of these kind of uh, military assets in the area, the the region, the, the risk of a of a unintended conflict uh, will increase. So I think it, it could contribute to the instability in the area. Thank you very much, Denson. That was Denson Chong, China correspondent for the Straits Times. Look out for his analysis piece at straitstimes.com. It's also where you can find more news and videos. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Harianto Diman. See you tomorrow for more on The Big Story.